we're looking at the first century church, Christians, believers of Jesus Christ. If you lived in the first century and you mustered up enough courage to share with a man named Saul, at the very least, you'd be persecuted, thrown in jail. Worst case scenario, you'd be put to death by Saul. It's an amazing story, the conversion of, of Saul and how God used him. I want to start with a question, though. Have you ever had this feeling? There's no way on God's green earth that this person could be saved. They're so evil. They're so nasty. They're so anti things of God. There's no way they'll ever, they'll ever come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Don't raise your hand, but have you ever felt that way? Maybe, maybe you've talked to someone and they seem so nice and you're sharing what God's been doing in your life, and they're nodding their head, they're engaged with the conversation, they seem so pleasant, so nice, and as you bring it to a conclusion, you think, wow, this is inside your thinking this. There's a whole dialogue going on in your brain while you're talking to them, and you're thinking, man, they seem so nice. I, I bet if I invite them to my Bible study or, or church, they'll probably come, and so you get to that point and say, you know, would you like to come to Bible study with me, or would you like to visit my church? And they... At that point, they look up and they say, no, no, that's not my thing. They seem so nice. That's not my thing. Maybe on the other side, that person you work next to, maybe the next cubicle over, they've been mocking you because of your faith. They've been, you, you've been the brunt of their jokes. They've antagonized you, even to the point of asking you questions just to entrap you and, and, and poke at you, ridicule you. You're the office talk. And so you come to the point, maybe initially you started praying for me, but you've gotten to the point where it's like, they're, they're, they're my enemy. There is no way. Uh, they're so anti-Christ and anti-God. There's no way they could ever be saved. Well, listen. Something we all need to embrace. No one, and I repeat, no one is beyond the reach of God. No one is beyond the reach of God. And so we're looking at an individual in Acts 8, and, and now we're in Acts 9, who was compelled. He was commissioned even. Felt he was serving God. Passionate about God. Felt he was serving God. And he felt he was serving God by persecuting Christians. His goal was to annihilate the Christian movement. And in that process, he felt through the whole time he was persecuting Christians, Saul felt he was working for God. In fact, he was endorsed by the religious leaders and, and affirmed to do that. So he had a legitimate cause endorsed by the religious leaders of the day to eradicate this early movement that we identify now as Christians. In fact, Saul presided over the death of the first Christian martyr. We looked at that last week, Stephen. Saul, in chapter 9 of Acts, we see his conversion. God changes his name from Saul to Paul. Saul means tall. God gave him the name Paul, which means small. It had nothing to do with his stature, but it had everything to do with, okay, Saul, I'm going to be big now in your life, and you're going to serve me. I'm going to be number one. He had an amazing conversion, so much so that it's repeated three times in the New Testament. It was a surprising conversion. A lot of people were suspicious about it. But I want to just give you a little bit of insight into this character we're looking at named Saul, who becomes Paul. We read that he's noted as Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus was a very important city in the Roman world, it's known for its universities. In fact, it ranks right up there with the universities of Athens and Alexandria of the time. Uh, Saul was a Roman citizen as well. He was educated uh, in the sense of, of Greek philosophy at Tarsus. He learned Greek philosophy. He learned Roman law. In fact, he learned things, obviously at the time, he didn't realize it at the time of learning, but he learned things that would benefit him and his ministry later on. Uh, 
he was deeply religious from a Jewish family, very strict religious home. He was part of the tribe of Benjamin, uh, which Israel's very first king, by, the, by way of uh, interesting note, was named Saul. Saul of Tarsus was part of the tribe of Benjamin. He became a Pharisee. Uh, Saul later became a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the legal ruling party of the religious sect Judaism, much like you would equate that to the superior court of our day. Uh, he became a powerful man. Saul became a famous man. Saul became a feared man. Powerful, famous, and feared. And certainly feared by these new believers of Jesus Christ. So we pick up in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 1. I have it in your notes. It's in the notes on the church app. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. It's interesting we see the verbiage of those belonging to the way. We, we know followers of Jesus today, we call them Christians. Uh, that term wasn't used initially. They were noted as belonging to the way. And I thought about that. And I thought, well, why did they come up with that name? Well, I think it, it's simply seen in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said himself, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And so followers of Jesus became followers of the way. We pick up in verse 3 of Acts 9. Now he went on his way, and he approached Damascus. And keep in mind, he went to Damascus to capture, hunt down, men and women who were Christians, followers of Jesus, followers of the way. And so he approached Damascus from Jerusalem, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And then I have the next few verses on the screen. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I have to stop there because you have to just kind of embrace the drama, the tension that's taking place here. Saul felt with all of his heart that he was working for God. Not only that, the religious leaders, the priests, endorsed what he was doing. They gave him letters of authority, credentials as it were, to go to Damascus, to leave Jerusalem, to go to these other cities, to persecute, to capture, to imprison, and yes, even murder men and women who were followers of Jesus Christ. And he's on his way to Damascus, and this bright light shines, this voice from heaven, it's the Lord Jesus, strikes him down, says, why are you persecuting me? Lord, who, who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Wow. This is one of the most amazing conversions, one of the most amazing testimonies I've found in all of Scripture. Then we pick up in verse uh, 6, but rise and enter this city, and you'll be told what you're to do. The men who were traveling with him, they stood speechless. Oh, no doubt, right? They stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So you see Saul, who was incessant in his quest to end Christianity. And he says later on in the book of Acts, in chapter 26, you can turn there if you want, it's in your notes. But he says later on, he's giving his testimony. And he's talking about kind of like what, uh, how bad of a person he was. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's, he's stating he was convinced. He, he thought he was doing God a favor, a service. He was convinced about opposing the things of Jesus of Nazareth in verse 10 of chapter 26. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Wow. And I punished them often in all, in all the churches, the synagogues, it says, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And, and here's what he 
This is the state of his temperament. He says, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them, even to foreign cities. So when you think about, Paul, Paul himself says what his temperament was during that time when he was persecuting Christians. When you think about that, and, and, and you go back to the first thing I asked you, can you imagine being in Jerusalem at the time that Saul was persecuting Christians and trying to witness to him? Oh my, he was in a fit of rage and fury against this movement of followers of Jesus. Can you imagine being in Jerusalem and, and, and Saul's doing all the things that he's, we've just read and approaching him and saying, Saul, Saul, ho hold on, hold on, before you go to Damascus. I, I feel like God's talking to me right now. And, and I want you to think about this. Before the day's over, you're going to be a follower of Jesus. Can you imagine saying that to him, how he might respond? But that was a fact. It really was. So in verse 8, Saul, in chapter 9, Saul wrote, rose from the ground. Although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. He was blinded by that experience. So they led him, the men that were with him, they led, led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, neither ate or drank. He was blind, without sight. He didn't eat. And he did not drink. And verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damas Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Okay. Everyone knows who Saul is. Certainly every believer knows who Saul is. You watch out for him. He's gunning for you. He's looking for you. He, he's looking to hunt every Christian man and woman down to imprison or murder them. And he thinks he's doing it for God. He's filled with passion towards this, this move of exterminating Christians. And now you're this guy, Ananias, who's a disciple of Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus. And, 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 and the Lord wakes you up, speaks to you, and says, Hey, I want you to go to this guy. By the way, his name is Saul of Tarsus. You, you know Saul? And here's Ananias' response in verse 13. Lord, I've, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief, chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And so Ananias says, wait a minute, God. I, God, do you think you have this right? You better check your facts, Lord. <laughs> you, you want me to go talk to Saul of Tarsus? You sure it's not Hector of Tarsus or Joe of Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus? I mean, I've heard about this guy. Really, God? You want me to go where? And talk to who? And, and here's Ananias. Verse 15, the Lord says to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Verse 17 of Acts 9. So Ananias departed and he entered the house and laying his hands on him, on Saul, he said, listen to what Ananias says to Saul of Tarsus. Brother Saul, there's a promotion going on there. You know, when we are a part of the equation of, of steering somebody to the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, simply said, when someone accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and, and you're part of that, whether you planted seeds or you had them pray with you to do that, at that point, at the conclusion of that prayer of, of them acknowledging Jesus for who he is, receiving forgiveness of their sin, sins, repenting of their sins, God forgives their sins through Christ, 
and writes their name in, in his book, the Lamb's Book of Life, they at that point become either your brother or your sister in the Lord. And so Ananias, he, he comes into the room where Saul is, and he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is just, friends, this is just powerful. It's an amazing story. It's amazing. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and he was baptized. I, I, I have to stop there and say, Paul has a, what we call the Damascus Road encounter, but he was converted. He became born again there. He, he met Jesus. His whole life changed. The first thing he does when he experiences that is he goes to prayer. It says that right here. And that's what we ought to do. We ought to be praying in everything, in all, everything that we do. He, he prays, and then Ananias comes and prays for him and just kind of confirms everything, and, and, and the scales fall from his eyes, and he can see clearly, filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he rose and he was baptized. I mean, such obedience to the ministry, the gospel ministry uh, of Jesus. And then verse 19, taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and so... They were probably pouring into him. Now here is a man, probably uh, would be likened to somebody who has their PhD of our day. He's an intellect. He knows the scriptures. We say the Old Testament, but in Paul's day, they were known as the scriptures. He knows the scriptures, everything about them. And, and, and now he sees things clearly. You know, those scales came from his, fell from his eyes and he could see, but he could see not only... In reality, he could see spiritually. He began to connect the dots, I believe. All the scriptures he had studied all his life about a Messiah coming, the realization that that Messiah is Jesus Christ, that he met the Messiah on the road to Damascus. It's an amazing story. And he's baptized. And he's taking food. He's strengthened. And, uh, and immediately in verse 20, and we see this, I always look for patterns when I'm studying scripture. And I see a pattern here. After he's ministered to and blessed and strengthened, he, he, he uh, immediately proclaims Jesus in the synagogues, in the churches. He immediately goes and starts preaching. And boy, I bet those messages were amazing. He's preaching and saying that he is the Son of God, Jesus is. And, and all who heard him, they were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon the name of Jesus? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus is the one you've been waiting for your whole life. You know Jesus, the one that you put on the cross, that died, that rose from the grave. He was preaching the gospel of truth. And people were amazed. His life changed. His life turned upside down from where it was. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Though, you know, and that's the response many times when we um, are sharing our faith or living our faith out. People either accept it and they're influenced by it or they reject it. And that's exactly what was taking place here in the story of Saul becoming Paul. They rejected and plotted uh, to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul in verse 24, and they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him, listen to this, they took him by night, and they let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And he's in Damascus at this point. And when he had come to Jerusalem, verse 26, so now, you know, there's, there's a time frame for however long it takes to get from Damascus walking to Jerusalem. But now he's in Jerusalem. And he attempted to join the disciples there. Now, Jerusalem, keep in mind, that's the mother church. That's the original church there, where the church leaders are. And so Saul is back in Jerusalem, where he started per his persecution. He's back in Jerusalem. And he attempts to join with the disciples. And, and they were all afraid of him, it says in verse 26. For they did not believe that, 
that he was a disciple. I mean, that, doesn't that make sense that they'd be afraid? I mean, this guy was gunning for them. He was hunting them down, and now he's wanting to meet with them and say he's a disciple. You would be suspicious of that, of the intent behind that. Is this a trap? Is he going to capture us? Is he going to kill us or, or put us in prison? And, and um, now we've got an individual named Barnabas in verse 27 who took him and brought him to the apostles. And, and now you've got this testimony of a faithful leader in the church, Barnabas, who declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, Saul did, spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so Barnabas is vouching for the legitimacy of Saul's conversion. And so he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, the, the Greek Jews, but they were seeking to kill him. Look at verse 30. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, and it was built up. It was growing. And, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. You see the dynamic of a powerful church. You see a church that's being persecuted. You see a church that's growing. The gospel's being spread. People are being set free. They're being healed. Powerful individuals now, such as Paul, are part of this movement called the Way. And, and, and the church is growing, being added to by those being saved. What an amazing, amazing testimony of, of conversion, of somebody that you would say, no way, are they, no way, would, they're so anti-Christ, and, and everything about their life doesn't, I don't think they can be saved. Some things you want to consider here that I found interesting. We call those who are followers of Jesus Christians. That's what we call them. But initially, they were noted as belonging to the way. That's number one. I want you to know that. There's, that's an important fact. They, they were noted as belonging to the way. Listen to me. Not a way. The way. Not a way. There's only one way. There's only one way. And that's Jesus, not a way. A lot of people think, well, you know, if, if you're a Christian, that's good, but you ought to keep a rabbit foot over here and a crystal over here and read your zodiac signs and, and fortune cookies and shake the magic eight ball. I mean, you want to cover your bases, right? No, 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 no. No, no, there's not a lot of different ways. And, you know, we all, we all really believe in one God, but it's just different. He's expressed in different names. That's, there's a Greek word for that. It's baloney. Jesus said he's the way. In fact, that's your memory verse this morning. Let's look at it. John 14, 6, it says, Jesus, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want to stop there. And thank God it doesn't stop there. But Jesus said he's the way, the life, and the truth. And you would think, okay, that's everything, right? But then he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. Another way you could say it, and it has just as much meaning, and it has the same meaning, is no one goes to heaven apart from Christ. Jesus is the only way. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, unless one be born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Saul had a born-again experience on that road to Damascus. Jesus is the way, not a way. He is the way. And so those initial followers of Christ were noted as being a part of the way, belonging to the way. Again, not a way, the way. And then the, another thing that I want you to look at is the very God, this is number two, that Paul thought he was serving, he was working against. Please don't raise your hand, but how many times have you been in that situation where you think you're working for God? You think you're doing what you're supposed to, but you're actually working against God. Paul, with his whole heart, and he put his whole heart, he didn't do anything halfway. He thought with everything that was with him that he was commissioned not only by God, but it was legitimized by the priest 
giving him the letters of credentials to do what he was felt called to do, which was to persecute, to end this movement, this new movement called the way, what we refer to as Christianity. Paul thought he was serving God, but he was actually working against God. And we see that in verses 4 and 5 of Acts 9. We've read it already, but I'll read it again. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecuted. Wow. Later on in Acts, and I have this on the screen, uh, chapter 26, Paul is giving his testimony and he recites what took place on the road to Damascus. And he says, and when I had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Why would Paul kick against goats? And by the way, who are the goats? And nobody likes to be kicked. Well, if you lived during the first century, you would understand what a goat is. A goat is a sharp stick. And they would use those to, to guide livestock, cattle and oxen. So if you wanted your cattle to go right and they were insistent on going left, you would just poke them with that stick, that goad. It's called a goad. It was sharp at the end. And that would influence them in a slightly painful way to go the way you wanted them to go. And, and what Jesus is saying to Saul is, you're kicking against my plan. You are trying to interfere and end what I've created. I have brought salvation to mankind, forgiveness of sins, a reason for living, eternal life. And you're trying to come against my plan? You're kicking against a sharp stick, Saul. It's going to hurt. It's an amazing story. I wonder how many times we find ourselves not really being in the center of what God had planned. Have you rebelled against God? Have you found yourself kind of floundering and wondering if you're even in God's plan? And I refer to God's plan as plan A. Plan A. The plan. The God who created the heavens and the earth. Anybody with any sense at all would recognize that when we look at the universe, when we look at creation, we know that there's an intelligent designer. You may or may not recognize who that is, but you, anybody with any sense at all would recognize that there's an intelligent designer. And I'm here to tell you that that designer has designed a plan for you. And I call that plan A. And so anything outside of God's plan is a different plan. You could call it plan B, C, D, so on and so forth. But it's not God's purpose. And so God has a plan for you as a husband, as a wife, as a single person, wherever you're at in your season of life, God has a plan. And the sooner you and I tap into that and submit to that, uh, the better off, trust me, trust me on this, the better off we'll be. Jesus said, if you choose to abide in me, you'll suffer tribulation. That's not good news, but it's truthful news. It's real news. And what it means is, when you submit to God and you start a relationship with Jesus Christ, life isn't easy. But whether you're a believer in Christ or an unbeliever, life is not easy. But when you're a believer and you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you look at things differently. You perceive things differently. So when tests come, when difficulties come, when challenges come, you look at them completely different than somebody that lives in the world would look at it. Because you see them as opportunities to grow, challenges. Yeah, they might be a horrible thing, a valley that you're going through, and you can't wait to get through it. But listen, you get through it. You get through it. And when you get to the other side, and you look back, and it's usually not till then, and some time passes, you look back and you say, God, thank you. I, I wasn't happy about this, and I, I didn't want to go through this, but Lord, you saved my tail from this, that, or the other. And I learned so much, God. And I see now, I, I couldn't see it when I was in it, but I see it now, God. And I'm so thankful and I praise you. You just look at things differently, don't you, as a believer? 
The early church was a passionate church. And the story we looked at today, you know what it tells me? It tells me that God's reach is big enough to reach out to anybody. And so you may have a family member, a neighbor, somebody at work that you're thinking, oh, I don't know. I can't even imagine they're holding a Bible or coming to church out. Or I just, that's not even, I can't even see them. You know, those who are most adamantly against Christ, sometimes once the Holy Spirit is just calling them to do it. They're fighting. They're giving the fight of their life. You'd be surprised. They might be closer than that real sweet, nice person that's looking at you and listens to your conversation and shuts your eyes.